Friends, I want to welcome you to this, our final week in our Making the Invisible Visible series, our reflection on art and discipleship and allowing it to give us insight on following Jesus today and every day. Now, you may recall that as we've worked through this series, we've noted that art can serve as a bit of an apocalypse, a bit of an apocalypse. Now, in its basic understanding, the word apocalypse is less about sort of the end of the world and more about an unveiling. It's about making what is hidden to come into sight. It makes the invisible visible. And so on this, our final week, I want to change gears a little bit. We spent six weeks allowing art to serve as a springboard. We looked at Starry Night, and then we took a look at the church at Overs, and then we looked at Van Gogh's bedroom, and then we spent a week discussing the potato eaters, and then we looked at Banksy, And last week, we took a look at Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Memory, all of it stimulating thought on discipleship and following Jesus for today. And all of it has hopefully served to remind you, you and me, all of us, that the life we create and our day-to-day decisions and relationships can serve as a masterpiece of sorts, making the invisible visible to all who interact with us. We are invited to reveal God to all who see us. Now, when it comes to faith and religion, some people can place an emphasis on knowing biblical theology or on knowledge of the Bible. And unfortunately, the process can make some grow cold and distant. They can almost get in their own heads. Now, friends, biblical theology is important. I, for one, enjoy reading theology in my spare time. I'm a bit of a a theology nerd for all things Jesus-y. So if we're talking theology, we're talking about the study of God, and if we're specifically talking about biblical theology, we're talking about the study of God through the pages of the biblical text. And it results in an understanding of God in particular terms. It's good. And yet God is always beyond. He's always beyond the language we try to weave to understand and describe him. Friends, at best, our language can merely point to God who's waiting to be experienced. A God who's waiting to be experienced. Now, uh, if you look around the room, you won't see me or my family. We're currently on vacation. We've driven out to Nova Scotia in order to do a combination of camping and cottaging with a whole lot of hiking on the itinerary. It's important to know that we planned our trip. We pulled out maps. We gauged timelines. We calculated how long it would take to travel from one place to another. And we even booked places that we were planning to stay at. The maps and the descriptions we referenced are a true representation of Nova Scotia. But friends, let me tell you, merely studying the maps and merely reading the descriptions does not allow one to say that they've experienced Nova Scotia. For that, well, that requires showing up. That requires you to go yourself. There are sights, smells, tastes, and sounds that define an experience of Nova Scotia that you simply can't get without being there. There's an East Coast warmth and hospitality that can only be experienced And then there's the culture. If you've been to Nova Scotia, you know that looking at maps and reading descriptions simply doesn't compare with actually being there. Now, studying studying theology and reading the Bible is so good, and I do encourage all of you to maybe do a little more of it. But it's also important to understand their role in the process of formation, 
They're like the role of a map on our trip. The map helped us plan our route, and we could consult it along the way to ensure that we were still on track, but truly experiencing, and that's something else. Experiencing God is something other than studying theology and gaining knowledge of the Bible. The daily choice to follow Jesus in your day-to-day, to to allow one's life decisions to be impacted by Jesus' way, is something other than studying theology and gaining more knowledge of the Bible. Friends, the invitation is to lean in and experience Christ through participation as part of his body, as part of the church. And yes, that is something entirely different than studying theology and gaining knowledge of the Bible. Experiencing God can be tricky. Because friends, God doesn't force himself on us. I think that at times that's why some have settled for mere study of theology and for uh, trying to gain knowledge of the Bible. These things are a little bit more tangible. They're more black and white. One can accumulate these through perspiration and hard work. One can feel accomplished and having arrived on their own merits. But experiencing God? Friends, experiencing God requires patient waiting. It involves submitting to the work of God in our lives, around our lives, and through our lives. It requires walking into the unknown, equipped only with a desire to be faithful and obedient, no matter what comes. And the pages of the Bible are chock full with people who faithfully lived the kind of life that God called them to, and they actually ended up experiencing God in the process. Early in the story, we see God make a covenant with Abraham. Yahweh would be his God, and he and his descendants would be God's people. Abraham would be the father of a great nation, a nation through which the entire world would be blessed. And in experiencing God, they, in turn, would be able to share that experience with others. Now, the story continues, and we see ups And we see downs, we see human faithfulness and failings. Yet all the while, we see a God who remains faithful, a covenant-keeping God. Now, when Israel is defeated and taken into captivity, the underlying reality is that God was still with them. God was still with them. The question is, would they remain with God? Let's zero in on four characters. The prophet Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, they were taken into exile. uh, And at this point, little seemed to make sense. From their ancient understanding of being a conquered people group, the general understanding was that their God had been defeated by the invading army's deity. So an argument could be made for a change of allegiance. Yet these four, friends, these four remained faithful to a seemingly defeated God. Now, when they were put in the leadership development program, they were given rich food to eat and sumptuous wine to drink right from the king's table. And yet they, they requested vegetables and water. They sought to, be, to remain faithful in this foreign land. And in it, they experienced God. Now, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, experienced success in captivity, and they were elevated to uh, positions of power. And then when a law was passed demanding that all people bow down and worship a crafted image of the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego remained faithful to Yahweh. They remained standing And they would not bow. And while they faced the penalty of their actions, they were seized, they were tied up, and they were thrown into a blazing hot furnace to be burned alive. A barbaric punishment, to be sure. Friends, it was a different time. 
Instead of being burned, though, they were met by an emissary of God in the midst of the flames who comforted them and protected them. And instead of being burned alive, they experienced God. Now, Daniel's faithfulness, wisdom, and his character vaulted him up the ruling hierarchy. He was promoted to the king's side. And for him, when a law was passed prohibiting prayer to any other god or any other person than the king himself, well, friends, even then, Daniel remained faithful to Yahweh. He continued his rhythms of prayer each day against the law. And he faced the penalty of his actions. He was seized and he was thrown into a den of lions. And a stone was placed over the mouth of the den and it was sealed with the king's ring. No escape, no mercy. A barbaric punishment to be sure. And again, friends, it was a different time. But instead of being torn to shreds, Daniel experienced God. It's interesting to uh, see that in following what they knew to be true, in being faithful to their God, in being obedient, they actually experienced God's presence and peace, God's activity in their circumstances. But additionally, in each story, their lives of faithfulness also revealed God to a watching world. In Daniel 1, when they chose to vegetables and water, well, we see that God caused them to excel in fine favor. There we see Daniel 1, verses 17 to 19. It says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into a service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with each of them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. None were found to be their equal. And then when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were pulled out of the blazing furnace, unharmed, King Nebuchadnezzar declared in Daniel 3, verse 26, he said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. Do you see what was revealed to him through their faithfulness? Well, God was seen to be the Most High God. Yahweh was seen to have the power to protect them, and he acknowledged it by calling them servants of the Most High God. When Daniel was camped out in the lion's den overnight, now this is in Daniel 6, uh, we can see uh, in verses 19 and following what happens. So he's camped out overnight. The stone has been sealed on the den, sealed with the king's signet ring, and the king tossed and turned all night. Verse 19 of chapter 6 says that at the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions, and they have not hurt me. Because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any, any wrong before you, your majesty. Well, the king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. Along with, uh, no one, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Friends, a barbaric punishment to be sure. It was a different time. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. And he said, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and revere the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. And he endures forever. 
His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Friends, you see here that Darius experienced God through Daniel's faithfulness, Daniel's obedience, and he in turn made a clear declaration that Daniel's God was the living God. These guys were exiled from their homeland, yet in faithfulness to Yahweh, they experienced God. And in doing so, they also revealed God to all who saw them. They served as a living apocalypse, unveiling what was hidden, the invisible being made visible. As we mentioned a couple weeks ago, Jesus' entire story served as a revelation of God's character and nature of God's love. He was an apocalyptic moment, an unveiling. Then in choosing some disciples, showing them how to live and live well, and then teaching them how to serve God through love of God and love of neighbor, and then sending them on a mission of love to all the world. Friends, we see that in this, he's called the church to serve in the process of unveiling, in the process of making the invisible visible through mutual love, grace, peace, by offering forgiveness, by seeking reconciliation where there is turmoil and chaos. Friends, as we seek to serve God each day of our lives, may we participate in the grand story of unveiling, a grand story of God's love for all creation. And friends, today may we embrace this invitation and may we live it out today and every day. Gracious Father, we thank you that you are at work in the world, unveiling your love for all creation. I thank you that you've invited us to participate in that. And I pray that we would embrace this invitation and see it as a primary reason for getting up each day to embrace your love of us and to reflect that love to a world that desperately needs more of it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.